This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today, alongside Bob Pastorella, we're going to be chatting with Lisa Quigley. And this is one of the longest This Is Horror podcast conversations that we've had in a long time. I think in over a year because we actually spoke to Lisa for over three hours. So of course we will be splitting this into numerous parts, but if you want to get it all in one chunk, then you can as a patron at the $4 and above level at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And if you're on the edge about supporting us on Patreon, Now might be the time because you get to submit questions to each and every guest and later this week we are chatting to the legendary crime writer Lawrence Block. So if you're a This Is Horror podcast patron at one dollar you get to submit a question to Lawrence Block and It doesn't get any better than that. So I wanted to give you the heads up. I don't normally talk about Patreon at the start of the episode. I save that for the outro, but this is a very special occasion. And this is something that myself and Bob Pastorella are very excited about. But on to this week's conversation. Many of you are probably familiar with Lisa because of the work that she's been doing as one half of the Ladies of the Fright podcast, but she is also a super talented writer. And this conversation marks the release of her debut novella, Hell's Bells, which is coming out any day now via Unnerving Publishing. And it is available for pre-order. It is available as an ebook and a paperback. And in these weird COVID times, I mean, publishers and writers really do need your support. So if you are intrigued, if you enjoy this conversation that we're about to get into, then do consider supporting Lisa and Unnerving and picking up a copy of Hell's Bells. And in our conversation with Lisa, we cover a lot of ground. This first part, we're talking a lot about her early life experiences, being part of a cult and then getting out of that, joining a traveling Christian band and indeed a little bit about how those experiences have shaped her. So that is what's coming up today and then in subsequent episodes we talk a little bit more about Lisa's writing but what's great is this whole conversation is dealing with thematic concerns that are pertinent to Hell's Bells so as I say if this is of interest to you then I certainly think Lisa's writing will also be of interest to you but before any of that let's have a quick word from our sponsors From best-selling horror author Lee Mountford comes the Supernatural Horror Collection. Three hugely popular novels in one box set. The Demonic, The Mark, and Forest of the Damned, together in one terrifying volume. Available in ebook and paperback, and a high-quality audiobook that is sure to get under your skin. Haunted houses, haunted forests, haunted people. Search Amazon and Audible now for the Supernatural Horror Collection. Don't just read horror, experience it. Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley, narrated by R.J. Bailey, is the brand new audiobook from This Is Horror. Including the British fantasy award-winning story Shark Shark, dive in and download Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley on Audible today at bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning in the U.S. and bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning UK in the U.K. 
Okay, well, with that said, here it is. It is Lisa Quigley on This Is Horror. Lisa, welcome to This Is Horror. Well, hi. I'm really beyond excited to be here. I'm so excited that you guys asked me or, um, you know, had me on. Yeah, we are incredibly pumped for this conversation. We've spoken to you before in terms of more crossover collaborations with This Is Horror and Ladies of the Fright. And of course, we've been on your podcast, but th this is great to finally get to have this solo conversation with you. And I mean, what a great occasion you have released your new novella, your debut novella, Hell's Bells, and I think it's fantastic. I recommend that everyone listening, if you haven't already, then go out and buy it. It is a great horror story. It is, in a sense, a coming-of-age story. It's got Freddie Mercury. It's got Queen. It's got Satanic Panic. And if you haven't bought it yet already, then... You know, well, what's going on? Press that button <laughs> and get it right away. So I'm excited mm -hmm. to talk about that. I'm excited to talk about your origin story. And that is exactly where we're going to go now. So as you may have anticipated, I want to know what were some early life lessons that you learned growing up? Uh, well, yeah, I did <laughs> anticipate that because you guys know that um, I'm a big fan of the show i've been listening for the last couple of years since i discovered you um and so yeah i kind of knew this was coming but um i've been thinking about it and i i grew up in a very it was kind of a strange childhood um my family was extremely religious and like it's like Christian religious, but like kind of to kind of past, I don't know, maybe the normal, um, I, whatever, what is normal, but, um, I guess very fundamentalist to a, to an extent extremist Christian, um, family. And, um, when I was six years old, my, my parents joined this church. So we lived in Michigan and then they, they joined this church that was in Indiana and we moved to go be a part of this church. And it, it took us a lot of, took my family, a lot of my parents, a lot of years to kind of realize. Um, but it kind of turned out to be a, basically like a fundamentalist Christian cult, like a very small one. Um, not one that would be in the news or anything. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so we lived in this apartment complex with um all these other members of the group and so i was also homeschooled and um there was just it was just kind of a weird thing like as a kid i don't think i realized that anything was super off i just thought this was normal life to grow up this way and uh it was as i got older um and i i started to my, like so okay i'm jumping around a bit but it's all relevant, I think, to what I, the point I'm trying to make. Um, when my parents realized that it was a cult, I was 12 years old. So we were involved with this group from when I was six to when I was 12. And we moved to a different area. And I mean, there was a whole a bunch of other stuff that happened, but um, we ended up leaving. They went to a regular church after that and kind of just started this healing process or whatever of like, deprogramming their their own mental um, issues from being involved in this kind of community. And as I grew, uh, I my parents shockingly stayed Christian because I I mean, you know, it's nothing against being Christian, but I kind of think a lot of times when you go through something that's that traumatizing, uh, you can tend to break from it. But they they stayed with the religion. They just, it softened a lot. They're still Christian today and they're still pretty deep in it, but they're very much more open-minded and like, um, and more like in the normal world than they were when I was a kid. Um, but 
for me, growing up in this religion, and as I grew and I started to develop my own interests and my own observations about the world, I I started to feel like I just didn't, that wasn't my worldview. And when I would try to bring that up, it was always just met with, well, that's, that's not, um, that's not, you don't really have a choice. This is our religion. Like you have to be this religion basically. Um, and as I kind of grew from that, it was like one of the first things I realized and had to realize, um, pretty early on is that just because an adult tells you something is the truth, it's not necessarily the truth. And I think going even deeper than that, it's like, just because anyone tells you something is the truth, it doesn't mean that's the truth. And and it's okay to check what you hear from people and what people believe and what people tell you is true against your own fact checking, your own knowledge, your own gut sense of what what is truth and what isn't. Um, and that can vary from person to person. So I think for me, it was, I, I think that's a lesson. Um, but it's something that kind of got started early on seeds that were planted. And that was like a big theme in my life was just kind of like, not just because someone tells you this is this is how it is that doesn't necessarily mean that's actually how it is. And, and, and I might come up with something totally different and that, and, and then learning to be okay with that and like confident in that, despite maybe your community telling you you're totally wrong or, or people in your circle or life or family. Um, and, and then just having to get really strong in that, I guess. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah. And there's an awful lot that you said that really resonates with me and my childhood and indeed probably from our ladies of the fright conversation you too have noticed some <laughs> parallels certainly in terms of the environment that we grew up in and then the impact that that had on adulthood and I think something that you said about as you're a kid you didn't realize anything was off and I mean that's how it always is I mean you you put such trust in your parents because I mean they are the authority figure it takes you a while to to realize that there's even a choice to to not believe or to not accept what they're saying and so I mean that's why being a parent is the biggest responsibility in the world but it can also be dangerous when I get I guess in in the wrong hands or in in hands in which perhaps have some some knowledge gaps themselves so to speak but I'm wondering you spoke about this cult and your family not realizing until six years later that they were actually in a cult so I wonder how did you realize it was a cult and then how difficult was it to get out and in fact was it dangerous so <clears throat> uh, we we moved there. So we moved from Michigan to Indiana when I was six and joined around then. When I was, I would, I think I was nine or I think I was nine. So after we'd been there for three years, they actually uh, kicked us out. <laughs> um, okay. Because, <laughs> but this isn't the end of the, like there's, we got, we stayed involved. It was like a, a purgatory kind of like they oh were my God. <laughs> yeah and this is so insane so they 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 told my parents um basically what it boiled down to was i guess it had stuff to do with my dad my dad is a very naturally quiet person very um internal he's very soft-spoken he's not um <clears throat> i guess what you would think of as a head of the household man um you know but you know very kind very gentle just a very quiet internal outdoorsy guy um observes a lot when he does speak it's very potent it's just he just is not a uh biblical husband leader guy you know um and so they they kind of, and, I, and I'm a little fuzzy on it, um, exactly what the reason was, but basically it boiled down to them thinking my dad wasn't taking enough 
uh, initiative to spiritually lead his family the way they thought he should be. Think something like that. Um, so they they kind of said like you guys we've been working on this for a while and you guys are just not up to snuff so you you have to leave you can't be living in in community with us basically they didn't want to reward bad behavior in their minds and they said you you if you want to stay involved with us we highly recommend that you don't go back to Michigan they didn't want us around our extended family because um, even though both of my my parents grew up in Christian households. Um, it wasn't Christian enough for this group. They, the group really thought that they were the only group of Christians that had it right. So um, if you were a regular Christian in America, going to a regular American Christian church, you were, you were not in, you were not on the path. The path was very, 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 very narrow, according to them. And um, so they, they said, you can't stay here, but you shouldn't go back to Michigan because they will just, your family will just lead you astray. So my parents <clears throat> moved, I, I don't even know how this happened, but we ended up moving to Kentucky, um, which was, I think, like a six hour drive from where we lived in Indianapolis. So we moved to Louisville, Kentucky, <clears throat> where we stayed in contact with them um where my family stayed in contact with them and uh you know with the intention of eventually getting back in their good graces so that they could go back be back part of it it's really hard for me to wrap my head around it because i just don't understand why you would be fighting so hard to get into get, to get back in like because of the personality i have and the mentality i have like i don't understand it at all but for them they they it got in their heads that this was the only group and they they were being separated from it and like rejected from it and so they needed to work like figure out a way back in we actually did go to church a uh, a calvary chapel regular church or whatever while i was um while we lived in kentucky and that church tried the i remember the pastors and the pastor's wife we got very close with them and they were very cool people <clears throat> and they tried to convince my parents that the group was a cult. They were like, this is major red flags. And my parents were like, no, 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 no. It's not, you don't get it. You don't, you're not, you don't know. And they would like counsel with people from the group and like talk about, you know, whatever. Um, so then eventually after we were in Kentucky for a year, they said, well, okay, you guys have been working really hard to try to like get better or whatever. So we can, you can come back, but what? But you can't come back to to Indiana. We're starting a new group in Arizona, like a like an offshoot group. They wanted to like their envision was to like plant different churches in different areas, which I don't think they've been really successful at because um, they're just getting smaller and smaller, and everyone's like intermarrying. It's very weird. But um, so they said we you and a bunch of other people who we also kicked out can go can go start a new group in Arizona and then they were going to send some trusted people from the main group to kind of like be the leaders of that group so that um they would have some non kicked out people to like lead or guide them or whatever and so we get there we get to Arizona we move to Phoenix and uh Ever, they picked another apartment complex. We all lived in the same apartment complex. It was another small group. And um, I guess after about a year there, they were still having the same issues with my, my parents and particularly with my dad. And at that point, we we left the group. Um, we they, they kind of kicked us out slash my parents were like, okay like they were like okay this is there's something wrong here and um we just were excommunicated again without the intention of coming back and then we just moved into a different complex on the other side of town and eventually ended up moving back to michigan um to be where my grandparents were and stuff but um when I asked my dad about it, because I've been talking to them more recently and just to try to wrap my head around it, I asked my dad, like, 
I was like, well, what happened? Like, what made you think it was a cult then versus other times? And he, he told me, he's like, you know, they just kept telling me what was in my heart and they were wrong. <laughs> and, and he's like, and I just, I couldn't, you know, I was like, no, you're wrong. That's not actually what's in my heart. And that's not and he And he just kind of was like, I'm not dealing with this anymore. Um, so yeah, that's how, how we got out. It wasn't dangerous or anything. It was just, uh, I think, especially for my mom who really was there more because my dad worked, my dad's a machinist and he worked kind of long hours and wasn't home a lot. I think my mom bore the brunt of the psychological um, impact of being in that kind of environment. The, the they didn't like say you can't go. They in fact they were just like go. You guys are a lost cause basically, and um and we don't want you here tainting this group. You're blah blah blah. You're out of the kingdom. So it for them it was more and particularly for my mom it was more the loss of of feeling like she had put all her reliance on this group as being basically her connection to God, and then they kicked her out, and she felt like God kicked her out. Like Mm. she, so it was like kind of for, I actually think, um, the harder part of growing up in a cult came after we got out and, and kind of like the blowback, the psychological blowback of my mom having to work through the, I mean, she basically had and has PTSD from the experience and um and as kids like we're we're all really young and and kind of like dealing with a mom who's we don't understand what she's going through and that it that she's basically suffering a for a while like a pretty pretty traumatic psychological break as she felt like she was coping with this rejection from god basically um and and her working her way out of that um she's like much better now and much healthier um, in terms of coping and dealing with all of that blowback. But, but yeah, it was, um, it's pretty crazy. So there was no actual physical danger. It was more just like the psychological um, trauma of working your way out of that kind of mentality. Yeah. And knowing quite a bit in terms of how cults work, I mean, it almost sounds like it was, premeditated and planned from the start and so they were looking for people within the cult who had a certain personality and were perhaps a little bit quieter and less questioning and you know people like your father who are very generous of spirit and so then if they could kick them out they could almost force them to kind of beg and to lung to be back in with the hope that they would then be more compliant and preach about the word to outsiders to because i guess Mm -hmm. if you if you can get someone who's so grateful to be back in then you can almost ask more unreasonable things of them and be more demanding and they're not going Mm -hmm. to question it because they're thinking you know i wouldn't want to be to be kicked out again and I mean I do wonder with with your parents not kind of going completely away from God and Christianity if 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 they didn't because that would almost be like a double rejection (laughs) and it's like they you know they Mm -hmm. couldn't go that far but obviously that's pure speculation and faith and belief and spirituality is such a personal thing that really only the individual can can say why they did or didn't do something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I it's so interesting because there have been people who've been kicked out who've either who've gone one of two ways, I, and it's very bizarre to me because I have noticed that um, there's just a couple because my it was kind of wild for a while. Um, I when I was in my early twenties, that was when. Um, the internet had been around obviously before then, but that was like a time when I, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to date like, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but like message boards were a lot more popular, like, cause we didn't have exactly social media the way it works now. And you could, that you didn't have Facebook with Facebook groups and like things like that. So there was, um, I don't know. 
how I stumbled across it, but I was like on the internet. I was like very curious if there was anything about this group anywhere um, online. And I somehow stumbled upon this message board that was all people who had been involved with them and gotten out. And um, I shared it with my mom and I actually am pretty convinced that that was not like I, you know, I'm what saved her or whatever, but that finding these people was a huge part of my mom's healing process because she felt validated for the first time. Um, she always, I think, felt like, like nobody really understood the, the trauma she went through or the fact that she, I mean, she always says like, I felt like I was brainwashed. And, um, so I, I actually think that that feeling of being brainwashed is a big reason why, why she stayed is that, um, anything else, if, you know, trying to introduce new ideas to her can make her very nervous because it feels like being brainwashed. Um, and yeah, so she fi we find this, this group, and um, she finally gets to start talking to other people who understood and could empathize in a way that other people really hadn't before. And that was kind of nuts because um, that turned into a whole thing. I got involved with it for a while, just like saying my piece. Um, they, people from that, that church or whatever, I don't want to call it like cult or whatever, would uh, started they found the message board too, and they were coming on and trying to like discredit everyone who was on there commenting by like revealing sins they had confessed or whatever. Um, yeah. And like saying, Oh, you, you're listening to this person. Well, let me tell you what they told me they did. And it was like, so bizarre. I can't even like believe this is real. Cause yeah. <laughs> Like I, and it feel I haven't thought about this in a really long time, but, um, but yeah, that was, I got involved with it for a while just to, I, cause I think I, growing up in the aftermath, I had like so much rage and anger toward this group and I felt like being on there, I got to say my piece, but I kind of got over it after a while. I was like, all right, I said my piece, I'm done with this group. All they want to do is like talk about this cult and I want to talk about some other things now. And but my mom stayed involved with it for quite a long time until basically those kinds of message boards became obsolete. But um, she would, in a way, she at one point, and she always stayed anonymous um, on those on those boards. But in a way, she would, she, I think at one point they figured out who she was, though. And she was like, oh, whatever. Um, but she would kind of, it was almost like she sort of organized a, and this, and I don't mean this to um, infringe on the actual Underground Railroad, because I know that was like way, you know, way more of a big deal, but it, almost like a something like that of like where she would f seek out people who were freshly out and like talk to them and like tell them what they were doing, that what they were feeling was normal. And like, I think that was a big part of her her kind of um she's never really probably going to move past it 100 percent, but but a big part of her getting to this more free place that she is now mm. well it's just like it's classic psychological brainwashing terrorist tactics man it's fucking <laughs> just hearing about this shit pisses me off yeah oh, tell me about it <laughs> Uh, yeah. And I can only imagine how you feel. I can only imagine because I'm, I'm like, this is like, I've been listening here just fucking gripping my fucking desk. <laughs> yeah, Bob, Bob's about, about to march over to the cult. <laughs> is Bob going to growl again? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah so, I mean, a, a little yeah, off-air reference uh, for <laughs> the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this is fucking, I don't know, man. It's just, because, you know, I haven't... You know, I have a background in psychology, and as soon as you said, as soon as you said that they were excommunicated, like the first time, all that that schooling, you know, because we did have, you know, a good section about what well, how how terrorists work and how like you know kind of like talk about like Patricia Hearst and stuff like that, and all that kind of stuff we learned come back, and that's that's classic. Hey, 
you know, because they're like, hey, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this group. We're going to kick them out. We're going to see how bad they want to come back. And just like you said, if they were if they come back, they'll, they'll beg to come back, and we can use them to recruit more people. Mm-hmm. And that's how they think. They're not thinking. In in this case, they make it sound like it's it's all for God, but it's not it's for them. Yeah, and it's a trip. Like there's a there's a leader. Um, his name is Michael Peters. Uh, he he. Uh, I don't even know like how this how like I don't I just can't wrap my head around all of it. Like how do you decide I'm going to go off and start a church? Like how do you just decide not just I'm going to start a church, but I'm going to like control this group like and then there's a lot of gaslighting like he basically if you say you're feeling controlled, it's like nobody's controlling you, you know. You're you're free to leave and free to go and free to do whatever you want. But if you want to be in God's good graces, you might want to consider this way. And that, but the implication, and I, there's so much more. I'm not even, I'm not even touching on. It's just like it there. Like when I look back and remember that this was just normal life. And I actually, when we were in the, in the group, I actually loved it because all of my friends lived in my neighborhood and we would play outside all day. And, um, I really had, I had no real idea. I did. The only thing I can really say is that I, I felt, um, like a weird energy, you know, not to get all hokey or anything, but like, I don't mean that in a hokey way. I just felt this undercurrent of like, something is off. I didn't know what it was. Um, I also knew that in certain situations I had to kind of be a chameleon and be with what, what, what I thought would impress different people in the group in terms of like how spiritual I was. It also bled into the kids. So like certain friends I had were more of just like my normal friends. Um, And then I had certain friends where I had to be more spiritual around, like one of my best friends in the group. Um, I remember, just as like a silly example, there were these dolls we all really liked called American Girl dolls. And one of our friends, and they were kind of expensive, and um, only a handful of maybe like a couple people had them. And one of our friends got one of these dolls and I was like so excited and I was raving to my best friend about it and like oh my gosh I really want one too and I was like this is so cool that she got it but I was going on and on about it and she stopped me and we were like nine maybe eight years old eight seven eight nine something like that and she's like Lisa I think you need to check your heart and see if you're having jealousy (laughs) And I was, like, so, like, and it was stuff like that, like, weird little things um, that would seep into my reality where I was, like, this doesn't feel totally right. And I remember being 100% creeped out by the the leader. Um, Like, I remember feeling like he thought he was Jesus or something or, or, like, one of the apostles or I don't know. I just was very creeped out to be around him. But other than that, like, it was in a way it was kind of this like wild childhood cause we didn't go to school. We, I mean, we were homeschooled. We homes, we got a lot of times we would get together with our friends and all of us would do school in our, in the same house. And then we would play outside all day and like we could spend the night at each other's houses whenever we want. Cause they were just right down the street. And um, it wasn't really until we were out of it that I realized like, Oh, something, something was wrong. So it was a very also bizarre feeling to, to have the experience of feeling like everything was wonderful. And then finding out things were not that wonderful. That was also really weird. Yeah. And when you mentioned the dolls, I thought you were going to go in a direction that someone I know went in who I'm, I'm not going to name because I, I do talk to them and like we, we are do have a good relationship but when they kind of came to Christianity they started like throwing out anything that they had that even tenuously had anything to do with 
magic or the supernatural because they thought, well, that that's not going to be good for God. That could be getting into to some dangerous territory. And so when I say that, you might be thinking of black magic and stuff. No, I'm literally talking about they stopped watching Harry Potter. <laughs> they got rid of all of their books. They got rid of Buffy. And actually, like, this, this reminds me a lot of... Uh, a, a certain plot point in your novella, Hell's Bells, <laughs> which I mean, what, I mm -hmm. guess like the first hook is, is, is something that is quite akin to satanic panic, where people are, are kind of blaming uh, the, the devil for, for rock music and for heavy metal and lis listening to these things is evil and you will summon Satan. Satan will become a part of you and indeed what one of my favorite quotes in your book is they're talking about black lipstick and how oh that that could be a little bit dangerous as well and and they just say what lipstick is a false idol now and i genuinely feel <laughs> that that is that is mm -hmm. the point though that some people take it to and I mean, I always felt so the way in which God was presented was as an all loving God. And the thing that I couldn't wrap my head around is if God is all loving, why would God want to stop and prevent you doing things in which you derive pleasure from, in which it is a pure and enjoyable experience? And if listening, to Queen and Freddie Mercury lights you up and you kind of transcend to another level, or if watching Harry Potter is a beautiful and enjoyable experience, then it, it makes zero sense that a loving God or, or a loving anything would want to take that away from you. I mean, imagine that my daughter's watching something and it, it's just really bringing her joy. And then I say, actually, I've decided that's not good for you. I mean, that doesn't sound like love, particularly if there's no evidence to, to, to prove that that isn't good. It just seems absurd and it seems like control and manipulation. Yeah, a mm hundred -hmm. percent. Yeah, I <clears throat> they were there was a lot of that in that group um, of, you know, they, they I think at one point they advised my mom to smash all her records and so she did um and she had like original beatles albums um she's like so mad about it now she's like she's like i had all of them like when they were first printed and i smashed them and um yeah like just kind of crazy stuff like that but they but then the things that they would let us watch kind of crack me up because they always would be like, all right, it was almost like they had to find an excuse to enjoy something that was secular. So an example is star Wars, like the, 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 um, when I was like seven or eight or something, I, I don't remember the exact age, but, uh, there, the, the whole cult went through this like massive, star wars obsession like even the adults like everyone but they turned it into a devotional so like we would watch one of the movies and then we would sit there and basically talk about how skywalker was like how star wars was an allegory for christ's um journey which is hilarious to me now because uh duh hero's journey yeah of course <laughs> like it's all like it, it is, but it isn't, mm -hmm. you know? So, like, it, it was so funny to me as an adult to be, like, you know, wow. And it was the same thing with, like, um, Chronicles of Narnia, which that Chronicles of Narnia was actually, uh, he actually was writing that as a Christ allegory. And then, um, but the Christ allegory is also the hero's journey, which is in, like, every story. Uh, not every story, but a lot of stories, a big chunk <laughs> of stories. And um, and then there was uh, one of, one that cracks me up is the Newsies, 
I don't know if you guys, <laughs> I don't remember how they made with, the movie. With young Christian Bale? Wow. Yes, yes. <laughs> that was like a movie that the cult became, like as a group, we would go through these like group, um, like someone at the top would be like, this is a good movie. We can all watch it, but we need to like relate it back to God. And like, so certain things were okay if it got approved, if, it, if, you, if they could find a Christian message in it. Um, and so that always cracks me up to like, look back and be like, the cult was obsessed with Star Wars. <laughs> and like, what? That's so weird. Cause it was such a, it was such a sterile environment. Um, we weren't allowed to, so we lived in an apartment complex. We weren't allowed to go swimming at the, at the complex pool. If anyone was there because we weren't supposed to witness like women in their bathing suits. Um, <laughs> Sometimes we would go and scan and be like, "Oh, there's only one lady there with a two with a one piece. There's no one there with a two piece. Like, we can we go and we and then we could go unless somebody arrived in a bikini and we would have to leave. And like, we were not allowed to like I wasn't allowed to swim in it like with my brothers without wearing a t shirt. I had to wear a t shirt even in front of my brothers. Um, wow. Toward the end, like later years in the group. Uh, like, so I always ask my mom too. I'm like, she said it wasn't like that to start. Like it, it was, but it got progressively stricter and weirder. And like toward the end of being there, we, like the women weren't allowed to go to the grocery store by themselves. They had to have a male, um, it had to go, they'd go in groups of like four women, have a male escort and, um, and the women weren't supposed to work outside of the house. So the guy, the men all worked. And then if there were single women in the group, they weren't allowed to even like be roommates. Like they had to live with a married couple to be like taken care of. And they always spun it like we're, we're caring for you until you have a husband to care for you. So it's like, it, this is a good thing, but it was obviously extremely just like patriarchal and misogynist and just like all kinds of fucked up. Um, but those are just like tastes of like the rules of like what it was like to like things that were allowed and that weren't allowed. And um, yeah, obviously going to public school was like basically inviting Satan into your children. Um, Cause like the devil would be everywhere tempting them, um, which is why we were all homeschooled. And yeah, it's pretty, pretty weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Growing up, and around here, we had <clears throat> we had a similar thing happen, but it wasn't like a cult. It was, it probably was, but it was like we had a lot of people that came in, come into the area back in in the nineties, and really up until like the last couple years, um, that have kind of infiltrated some of the people, even like people I work with, and they, they, you know, they, I work with this one guy who goes to church and. And, uh, he, he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't watch like certain movies. Um, he doesn't, uh, listen to certain music. Um, he doesn't read certain books. Um, but he, he's, 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 but he's very curious about a lot of this stuff. And so it's like, he'll, he'll ask me, Hey, have you seen this movie? Yeah. And he's like, a lot of people say, you know, but he always feel like, he goes, man, it's people say that that's kind of like satanic, you know, <laughs> and I'm like a film, <laughs> you know, and he's like, yeah, and I'm like, you know, and, but the prime, I guess the big example is that they, it, it's, it's like this, it's like the same people who blame the school shootings, you know, on, on the music and, and all of that. And if you look, and it's like if you take these these kids, especially if it's a kid who's done a school shooting, to me, the one thing that I see in a lot of them that that they that they all have in common isn't the music, but there is a commonality there. It isn't the films, but there is one. And there's so many things, but the main thing is is that they don't have anybody guiding them. Yeah. And it's like that. The religious groups tend to, they want to blame problems that just in general life can bring you on things 
that they don't like and don't understand that are tangible because they can destroy that. And it's, it's just, it's sickening. And it's like, no, it's because society is screwed up and it's going to take a lot of work to fix it. And you're not up to the task. So let's get rid of heavy metal. (laughs) Cause we can touch it and feel it. Yeah. Yeah. What I even think saying the answer is no one is guiding them is obviously a simplification of what's going on. I mean, there are different circumstances for different people. I mean, another Mm -hmm. thing that we'll often talk about pertaining to that is the lack of mental health and social care. So there are a multitude Mm -hmm. of reasons. And I mean, a lot of people are trying to look for easy answers or an easy blame when there isn't because this is fucking complicated, but you know, Mm -hmm. complex solutions. um, I mean, they don't make great headlines. They're not easy talking points. And I mean, people like to be comfortable. They don't want these uncomfortable truths. And that's why we've seen video games blamed. We've seen heavy metal blamed. We've seen, drugs blamed but people aren't looking at what's actually going on here what is the underlying cause and i mean often when people focus in on something they'll choose something arbitrary like oh they liked heavy metal well why why not choose something else arbitrary oh they all had brown hair or you know (laughs) they're all men or whatever it happens to be in that specific situation yeah, I mean, and you're right. We're never going to see like any type of headline out there in, on a major newspaper saying society decides to upheave itself and become more responsible. You know, I mean, it, they're going to blame this school shooting happening because of blah, you know. Mm. But in the, in the reality, you're right. It's it's these are these are complex things that won't fix themselves overnight. But every to me, it's like every time something bad happens and they want to blame the wrong thing, especially if it's something that I tend to like, I'm going to be a little bit more defensive about it. You know, Uh, if somebody says, well, it's all those damn horror movies. You know, and somebody else stayed at at work, too. And they usually like saying it in jest, like it's all those horror movies. I'm like, we got to lock them up. We got to lock up every one of them and keep them from being seen, except for people who like them. Y'all can send them to my house. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know? the last time I checked, I haven't killed anybody. So, hey, you know, I'm going to make up. I don't get my heart released. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it, 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 it's, it's a very complex thing that won't fix itself overnight. But it, it, it is, it is, so frustrating even now it's like here we are 2020 i think we live in more in a more secular society in in general than ever before and we still get this this bullshit (laughs) yeah man you know And and then and then we have to deal with these ridiculous cults yeah and I'm sitting there, and I, I've, read, I've read a lot of Hell's Bells. I've read, like, most of it, right? I'm not done. I'm admitting. But, <laughs> That's fine. You know, but I've read a lot. Of, I, my reading list is really big. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but it, and it's so good, and I see that in that, you know. But I'm all, And I see what, what you grew up with in there now, you know. And... Uh, I will, I will tell you this, the way that you write and your particular personal growth story would make captivating fiction, fictionalized. So, but again, that's, you know, something that's up to you and it, it's probably going to be a big bridge. Well, I feel you know? to a certain extent that's what we've got in Hell's Bells, but that's that's an area I want to jump into um, a little (laughs) bit later, in fact, because Mm -hmm. during my research, am I right in thinking that at some point you were a member of a traveling Christian band? 
Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> How on earth would you even find that? Is it on the internet? Did I how would you find did you hear did you hear did Max Booth tell you? I think I told Max Booth, but uh the episode's not live yet. Um that is so funny. Yes, I was. <laughs> um so when I was uh let's see, when we were when I so I kind of like got you guys up to some tell you I'll just tell you this is on a sub a sidebar is that when people ask me where I grew up, it's such a complicated answer. And I'm always like, well, I was born in Michigan, but I grew up in a lot of I lived in a lot of different places, and then their default question is always um, oh, were you military? And I'm like sitting there for a second, like, hmm, do I say, nope, grew up in a cult and moved around a bunch because of it? Or do I just say like, no, my, my easy answer is my dad, my parents like to move and my dad moved a lot for jobs, um, which is like part true. Cause I think my parents do like to move a lot, but, um, but also not it's like too complicated of a story when I'm just trying to tell someone where I'm from um but so I was uh 12 years old we moved to Michigan and then when I was 14 this was unrelated to the cult but my parents really did like living in Arizona um, my grandfather passed away after we like a couple years after we moved back to Michigan so they kind of felt like they didn't have to stay in Michigan anymore. Not that they didn't want to, but they were, they had like this wanderlust. So my dad got this job offer in El Paso, Texas, which um, he was like, it's supposed to be like a desert. It's probably a lot like Phoenix. Eh, no. Um, <laughs> have you been there, Bob, to El Paso? No, I have never been west of Waco. I want to go to El Paso, uh, but that is, um, from where I live, it, if you go east, you can drive for 10 hours and you hit the ocean. <laughs> but if you go west and you drive for 10 hours, you haven't even hit El Paso. I got it. Yeah. Because Texas <laughs> so is kind of, like, it's kind of a ways away. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. So we moved to El Paso, which is not Phoenix at all. Um, it is very different. I, I, had my high school years there although i was still homeschooled um because they didn't break out of that until my siblings were going through high school and they got to all go to high school but that's another story for another bitter day um but yeah so we go to el paso i'm homeschooled there and my mom finds this homeschool co-op group which is basically um, a bunch of homeschool families who who want to um, like they don't want to send their kids to school, but they want their kids to get some socializing, and they also want help with maybe subjects that they don't um, that they don't feel like they're experts in. So there was a they would they rented out this community center, and we would go, and um, I could take like I, I took an English class, and I took I think like. I don't remember like a history or a math class or something and um and but it was all through the co-op so it was still i was still homeschooled but it was like a way to provide support to homeschool families um uh another sidebar i will never homeschool my kids unless covid goes on forever <laughs> right right um, <laughs> um but uh yeah so in the homeschool co-op group i met the 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 woman, the young woman, the girl who would become my best friend. And there is a lot of that relationship in Hell's Bells too. That was a kind of catalyst for it. It was, um, cause I just don't think there's any other experience like a teen high school best friendship. It's like so life or death, um, like on another level but her family was uh we we got to so she was like pretty much my age we became inseparable um and this was a big deal for me because with being a homeschooled kid who moved around a lot i like really struggled to find friends and i wanted friends so badly so i like never felt like i had best friends i, 
I had different best friends throughout, you know, the years from church or whatever. But um, this was that first time I felt like I was having that, like, true, true, like, kid, teen experience of having, like, a real best friend. And we, um, like, did everything together. We we went through phases where we would be at each other's houses back and forth for, like, we would not spend a night apart for, like, three months. It was probably a little toxic um, because we were just inseparable, like, probably very codependent. Um, but, like, we would just stay at her house until my mom was like, you haven't been home in a week. You should probably come home. And um, so I'd be like, all right come to my house and so she would come to my house and stay the night until her mom was like you got to come back and we would just go back and forth to each other's houses and um her parents were super religious super christian um but they they were more of a um they came from a more uh i always forget the word it's a Pen- oh no, what is the word? It's like the the more mystical Christianity. I can't believe I'm spacing on the word. Um, but like the kind of churches where you go to and they're like speaking in tongues and they're, um, the pastor calls everybody up and they do this whole thing where he's like screaming in your face for the, you know, whatever sickness and like touching you and you're falling down and um, mm. yeah. Pentecostal? Ban- Are we talking about evangelical churches? Uh, I think Pentecostal mm-hmm. might be, it's like they're evangelical also, but there's a more spiritualism aspect mixed in. And so they were like very much more into like the mystical side of Christianity and like spiritual warfare and like the demons all around you invisibly and angels. There was a battle going on behind you all, all times and like this between like heaven and hell and all this stuff. Like it was all very like, um, I don't know if mystical is quite the right word, but like very much like getting visions and getting perfect words and like all of that kind of. It's thing. almost like a paranormal version of Pentecostal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. They were very into that. Very... Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like, but I also like really gravitated toward that version of Christianity since I didn't have a lot of options. I was like, that's cool. I want to learn more about the demons flying around in the yeah, air. Like, yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And um, so, but her dad was like a former, uh, which probably explains like why they were into the kind of Christianity Christianity they were. They were like total hippies. They were like former like hippies, like before they were converted. Um, her her dad always had dreams of being like I don't know, like I'm trying to think of who would be the guy he was looking up to at the time. Maybe like Buddy Holly or like I don't know. Uh, I, I can't I think of like who, Manson, but yeah, who, who <laughs> no, I almost said Charles Manson, <laughs> <laughs> but like in terms of music, like at that, like the sixties and seventies, like, um, mamas and the papas kind of like, like vibe, but like, very, I can't think of who, but like, you're, I'm thinking of like the, he, he, he would like play the organ and the piano and like sing. It was very much like singer songwriter, Elton John type of stylish, but not really like, oh, like a very like, like D version of that, you know, who? More folk music, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like that folk rock, um, like hippie like rock. America, kind of. Like, uh, hey. you know. Right and do the desert horse no no name and all that. Absolutely. So he yeah. he yeah. was a big like I mean I I think they would have gone to Woodstock if they could have gone mm-hmm. like they were like that kind of hippie like very much into like the the mysticism and the and the free love and blah 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 all this stuff. But then they got converted and so they, I think they went to like the Christian as close as the Christian version to that that they could get like that. But he never lost his desire to be a musician, so he kept writing music. He just started writing Christian songs, and he, um, like, basically just didn't have a band anymore. He just had a bunch of kids and made music with them. He had, they, it was kind of, their family's, like, such a trip because they had, like, three kids who were, like, the original three, and then... They didn't have kids for like 10 or 12 years. I don't remember the exact time. And then my best friend was born and then they had two more. And so they almost had like two sets of kids in like totally not quite different generations, but kind of. 
Like, I think their older kids would have been Gen X and their younger kids were millennials. Um, and their oldest kids, like, they were just a musical family. Their oldest kids, like, went on to be a relatively successful Christian band at one point. Like, not, like, super well-known, but, like, decently. Like, they were making their living off of it. Um, and he, uh, but but my friend's dad, whose name was Tom... Tom, like, just would keep making music with his kids. And so at the time that I met them, they were just, like, playing around different churches. And one of the things they did every, I think it was, like, every Tuesday or Wednesday was they would go to the rescue mission, uh, which was basically, I think, like, a, a Christian place for the homeless. Um, I don't know. I don't really remember. It's been a long time. So they would go to this place called the rescue mission, and they would to put on like a musical show for all the homeless people. And Sarah found out, Sarah was my best friend. She found out that I like to sing um, at church and stuff. And she was like, we somehow it came up, something came up. She sang something and I harmonized with her. And she was like, you should come sing with us on, uh, you know, when we go up to the rescue mission. So I started going with them and started singing with them. And it eventually like snowballed into this whole thing. Her dad had this whole vision that we were going to be like basically the next, like what's the Partridge family or something. <laughs> I and, almost said that. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and, and like, like he had those kinds of like lofty visions of like what we were. And it was really just like a family making music, which was fine. It was really fun, but we would do all kinds of, um, random, uh, you know, gigs at churches. Um, and then our big crowning moment was we, we did a tour of churches across Texas ending in Austin with one of her dad's friends who had a recording studio. And we recorded a CD of, of all the music that he had written. Um, and then we toured our way back, um, <laughs> but it was like a tour of like these just random ass churches and uh yeah <laughs> so we made a we made a cd called um i think it was called the watchman or the i forget exactly what it was called something about the watchman and um which was the title of one of his songs and it was he called they, we were called the tom lipinski band and apparently you can find out about it somewhere online <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah, I was in a, in a semi-touring Christian family band, family Christian, 70s yeah. rock band. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can track down the Watchmen. I've already during this conversation managed to find out a lot about the Michael Peters cult. So you're just, you're giving me like oh, an, yeah. in, enough <laughs> a, of a teaser for me to find out information about all of this. So, you know, mm -hmm. may, may, maybe for the end of the episode, the Tom Lipinski band will play us out, depending <laughs> on what I can mm -hmm. find. <laughs> wow. It, it, it was a, a real... A real trip and yeah. it was so bizarre we would play like park festivals in the summer um I, we for a long time mine and sarah's uniform was to wear pleather pants and <laughs> and, <Yes. laughs> and her dad joked like our joke was that as our own band because we always thought we wanted to make our own like we thought our version of music that we would do is like much more like sounding like the cranberries type of harmonizing and music and um and we, our joke title of our band name was the Pleathers, um, <laughs> but it never, it never went beyond the Tom Lipinski band. Well, I mean, never say never. Maybe that's a little project for the future. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Thank you so much for listening to the conversation with Lisa Quigley. Join us again next time for the second part. But as I said at the start of the episode, if you want to get it ahead of the crowd, if you want every episode ahead of the crowd, if you want to be able to submit questions to guests like the legendary crime writer Lawrence Block, 
then become our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And Patreon and Lawrence Block are not the only exciting things that we have coming up at This Is Horror. Because recently we announced the This Is Horror Awards. This is an annual event in which you, the reader, the listener, get to vote for the best horror from the past year. So we have categories like Novel of the Year, Novella of the Year, Non-Fiction and Fiction Podcast. Check it all out. See what your favourites are and then cast a vote. Throw your nominations our way by sending an email to awards at thisishorror.co.uk. Okay, before I wrap up, a quick word from our sponsors. Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley, narrated by R.J. Bailey, is the brand new audiobook from This Is Horror. Including the British fantasy award-winning story Shark Shark, dive in and download Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley on Audible today at bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning in the U.S. and bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning U.K. in the U.K. From best-selling horror author Lee Mountford comes the Supernatural Horror Collection, three hugely popular novels in one box set, The Demonic, The Mark, and Forest of the Damned, together in one terrifying volume, available in ebook and paperback, and a high-quality audiobook that is sure to get under your skin. Haunted houses, haunted forests, haunted people. Search Amazon and Audible now for the Supernatural Horror Collection. Don't just read horror, experience it. Now, if you have something that you would like to advertise on This Is Horror podcast, then do drop me a line, michael at thisishorror.co.uk. That's right, advertising is the subject line, and I can get back to you with our rates, and you can see if we're a good fit for you. And as I'm sure you'll have noticed as listeners to the podcast, we make sure that we're advertising things that are relevant to you so that these adverts complement your whole listening experience. So this isn't about Casper mattresses and crates of wine, even though maybe in a pandemic, crates of wine might be useful. But, you know, unique circumstances. But no, this is about horror. This is about books. This is about other podcasts and comics and art. So if you've got something that you want to advertise and you think our audience will benefit from hearing about it, then shoot me a little message, Michael, at thisishorror.co.uk, subject line, advertising. As always, I would like to end with a quote. And as we will be chatting to Lawrence Block very soon, I thought I would end with a quote from Lawrence Block. And he has many amazing quotes to choose from. He's written a number of books on writing. He's been very generous with his wisdom. So it was difficult to find just one quote. But here is one that I hope will resonate and will spark inspiration if you're finding it a little bit difficult to write. So here we go. The less attention I pay to what people want, and the more attention I pay to just writing the book I want to write, the better I do. I'll see you in the next episode for the second part of the conversation with Lisa Quigley. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.